A critical chapter in the first ever criminal trial of an American ex-president is coming to a close. Questions now swirl about what happens next in the Trump election interference hush money criminal trial. For Team Trump, the clock is ticking after defense attorney Todd Blanche failed to land any significant blows to Michael Cohen's credibility, something they're desperate to do after Trump's former attorney put Trump in the room where it happened, squarely in the center of the scheme to both catch and kill negative stories that could have hurt Trump's presidential campaign had they come out before the election. Cohen also told the jury that Trump himself signed off on the plan to hide the reimbursements as legal expenses. <clears throat> the defense's, excuse me, the defense's failure to poke holes in Cohen's credibility was not for lack of trying. Todd Blanche started this way. These are literally the first words out of his mouth to Mr. Cohen. He says, quote, Mr. Cohen, my name is Todd Blanche. You and I have never spoken or met, have we? To which Cohen replied, we have not, Todd Blanche. But you know who I am, don't you? Cohen answers, I do. Blanche asks, as a matter of fact, on April 23rd, so... After the trial started in this case, you went on TikTok and called me a, quote, crying little rhymes with hit, didn't you? Cohen replies, hmm, sounds like something I would say. That earned Blanche an objection from prosecutors, but he went on to then detail comments Cohen had made about Donald Trump. New York Times puts it this way, quote, Mr. Cohen responded calmly that those sounded like things he would have said leaving the defense still hunting for a moment that would badly damage his credibility. Once Cohen is off the stand, the $64 million question becomes this. What does Trump do? Does he testify? In court yesterday, Todd Blanche kept his cards close to his chest, saying no decision had been made as to whether the ex-president will take the stand. In fact, it's unclear at this moment to us and to Judge Juan Marchand if the defense will even put on a case. Judge Marchand asked, quote, so if I understand you correctly, your only witness on defense that you know of right now is the expert possibly? Todd Blanche replies, correct, Judge Marchand, and maybe not. And Todd Blanche says, and maybe not. <laughs> The defense does not put on any witnesses. Jurors will have heard from about 20 prosecution witnesses, ranging from White House aides and consummate Trump insiders, all the way to bankers and paralegals with only remote ties to the ex-president. And they will also have a ton of paper, a ton of documentary evidence to take with them and consider, including a potential smoking gun in the form of those handwritten notes from Trump org employees up there on your screen now. New York Times reports this, quote, one month in, the jury has heard about porn stars, payoffs, and campaign panics. But whenever jurors get the case, perhaps before Memorial Day weekend, they'll also have a raft of documents to evaluate. These include a series of checks sent to Mr. Cohen, who reaffirmed repeatedly on Tuesday that the description of the checks as payments for a legal retainer were false. The Trump election interference hush money trial barreling toward its conclusion is where we begin today with some of our most favorite reporters and friends here at the table. Two of the best of the best, NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard and former executive editor with American Media Inc., special correspondent for The Hollywood Reporter, Lachlan Cartwright. Our friend Andrew Weissman is zooming in from Parts Unknown. As soon as he's here, we'll pull up a chair and he'll join the conversation in progress. Von, where are we? We are here at the moment. <laughs> where this... I mean, I know where we are. I know where we are, you know, located. But where are we in this trial? Looking at those jurors there yesterday and watching their eyes, number one, they were engaged. Yeah. And what they were doing was looking at Michael Cohen, back over to Susan Hoffinger, back to Michael Cohen. In the afternoon, they were looking from Michael Cohen to Todd Blanche, back to Michael Cohen here. It was very clear that they were engaged. They have followed a story up until this point, and now they are hearing the words of the man who says that he was the middleman mm -hmm. for Donald Trump in this scheme to help him get elected for, to the presidency of the United States. And for them, there's one man in that room that they haven't heard from, and that's Donald Trump, the defendant who has been slouched down backwards in his chair consistently with his eyes closed 80 to 90 percent of the time. And it's up to those jurors right now to determine whether they believe the man with his eyes closed or the man that is sitting there mm -hmm. frequently looking and telling his story directly to them. That is where we are. And Thursday could very well be the final time that they hear from Michael Cohen, the last witness for the prosecution. 
It's impossible to stump you, but I feel like I surprised you when at this hour yesterday I said, I looked at, at the New York Times blog, I looked at our notes from inside the courtroom, and I said, um, Todd Blanche is bombing. And it might have been a little over my skis at the moment because I only had, I had reporting from inside the courtroom, I had reporting from the Times blog, but I read Politico and Axios and the Washington Post and the New York Times in our coverage, and it is at best a disastrous first impression. It didn't look like a strategy to indict the cold, hard evidence that this jury has seen. Right. Any reporting on what happened? I think, well, also, if I may, like sometimes as a reporter, we jump into stories that we're not always necessarily experts in. I am not a legal journalist, right? <laughs> and so that is where, you know, I didn't know how to initially wholly yeah. respond to yesterday, other than to tell you that it was weird. There was yeah. dead air in the room. It was stagnant. Todd Blanche seemed to be going down odd tracks that just didn't connect with me as a human being who was trying to find out why did he care whether Michael Cohen was leaking stories. Of course, he was selling books to make money for his family, right? Those were all obvious points there. And so that was the sort of affirmation on the back end of that, that no, that is not a common cross-examination here. And I think that the question here is that it's too late to switch out Todd Blanche at this point, or we could assume. Mm -hmm. But for Donald Trump, was sitting a mere 10 feet away mm -hmm. as his attorney there is going through that questioning. I don't know exactly what led to this moment here, but they have had a year to plan for Michael Cohen. They have had uh, six years to plan for Michael mm -hmm. Cohen, and that is what they came up with in the cross-examination, questioning him on whether he was trying to work with investigators because he wanted a shorter prison sentence. And the difficulty is, a mere two hours earlier, Michael Cohen told the jury explicitly, I lied. I was a bully. Yes, I did all those things. Yes, I've sold books because I'm trying to support my family. Everything that you're now asking me on cross-examination is, is completely compatible with everything that I already admitted to just this morning. Yeah, I mean, we're not lawyers, so we should sneak this in before Andrew Weiss. I definitely. <laughs> before Andrew Weiss, because, I, I mean, maybe, maybe some of the challenge was that what the prosecution had Cohen do by the end was, you know, cook the crow, eat the crow, swallow the beak, eat all the feathers. So, so, so Todd Blanche got up trying to get him to, to, to make him feel bad. And, and the prosecution had already done that work. What, what it would seem to me maybe was, was an inability to pivot when the prosecution had already done some of the damage you planned to do to Cohen. And, and even before that, because we had that being introduced through numerous witnesses you know, right. early on, through you know, David Pecker, through White House officials, through to Hope Hicks, you know, saying that you know, he's the fixer because he breaks everything. So <laughs> almost by the time we get to Monday where Michael Cohen comes in, you know, the jury's expecting this big bad wolf who's going to scream and shout and carry on. And he just wasn't that. He was very cool, calm under pressure and then fast forward when the cross comes and you know i was sitting there expecting you know this full frontal well thought out very strategic very you know planned out and it just was this scattergun approach that you're just like oh he's a jilted lover or he's leaking stories or he's in it for the money and they just didn't land a, a blow there and you know i'm very curious where we go to you know tomorrow where we have they recalibrate if they come up with some other strategy, because they're going to need to. They're going to need to do something here. Right. They haven't addressed the, the bits of paper. It, this this right. comes back to all of these documents, Nicole. They haven't addressed any of that. The recording, that dynamite recording between, you know, Cohen and, and David Pecker. You know, they need to actually address some of this hard evidence. And, and that's where tomorrow is, is going to become very essential. Do we know if it's a normal thing to not know yet if you're going to put on a case? I, I, we'll I, put this I, on our is, list for Andrew Weissman. No, I, I, I think that we're dealing with the reality that tomorrow the prosecution could wrap up after its redirect of Michael Cohen, right. if they so choose to, and that this could come down to closing arguments as soon as Monday, and this could be sent to the jury Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, mm -hmm. and we could have a ruling next week. For the defense, it is difficult to fathom them not bringing anybody forward. And I only say that, again, not from a legal expert place, but from a place of, uh, of understanding Donald Trump and his politics, right. is that you go into the ring, right? Today it was about a presidential day. Let's get ready to rumble. He likes to fight, right? right? He wants every opportunity because he truly believes that not only is he his best spokesman, but he also hires the best. And so he has publicly said that his, uh, his attorneys are doing well on his behalf. But ultimately, let's see next week if his team mm -hmm. actually brings a case forward here because the difficulty for him is that he has watched an array of individuals including hope hicks 
Madeline Westerhout, very close individuals to him, come in and testify and provide evidence that could ultimately be what leads to a guilty verdict for him. Um, I mean, and it started with David Pecker, I think, who who sort of, he didn't present the smoking gun, he loaded it. Um, Hope Hicks, you know, carried it around. And then it was pulled by those real bombshell documents. And the idea that nothing would be presented to refute what jurors have seen with their eyes and ears feels like a risk that someone like Trump, he certainly didn't take it with the with the voters in 2016 when he made sure that Pecker would, you know, smear his opponents and, and hide the stories that threatened him. And you asked me live on air, you were also <laughs> on, mate, uh, you know, what does David Pecker know? And I said a lot before he got on the stand. And he really was the, the ultimate tour guide, wasn't he? He took us through back to that meeting in, in August of 2015, which really is the scene setter for a lot of this, where mm -hmm. he meets, he goes to meet with Michael Cohen and Donald Trump, and they ask him, what can you do for the campaign? He says, I'll be the eyes and ears. I'll purchase negative stories off the market and we'll run negative stories about your rivals. And then we've gone on to hear this case in really you know, forensic detail from the likes of Stormy Daniels about why her story was so critical to come off the market just before the election in light of the Access Hollywood tape. And I, I just sort of think to myself, well, what is the defence going to bring? You know, the prosecution has brought such a strong case. What is the defence going to bring to refute a lot of this?